Welcome to the Kings Beat Podcast. I am James Ham, your Kings Insider for ESPN 1320. Up there in the right hand corner, if you're watching on YouTube, is Sean Cunningham, who's laughing from Fox 40. What's going on, Sean? Oh, nothing, James. Everything's great and glorious. Hopefully, my answer doesn't freeze you this time. Like, are you still with us, James? I'm still here. I, th- I think Beautiful. I'm still here. We're having massive uh, internet issues, not even Wi-Fi issues. I'm all hardwired in, but uh, massive internet issues up here in the sticks. It's like someone forgot to like start the the coal machine to like fire up the internet power. Uh, and of course, uh, we are joined by Brendan Nunez from the King's Pulse Podcast. What's going on? <laughs> I am doing good, fellas. Uh, nice to be talking to you, and we got some... I guess actual news today. News today, news on Sunday. You know, I, I guess we'll start there, right? Um, have the Kings mastered the art of like weird news dumps, like in like oddball times? Because it feels like they have. Like you know, Mother's you Day mean? afternoon, oh. they hired Mike Brown. Um, you know, we like every single time there's a major event. Like in real in the real world, they seem to like. Hey, look, we're gonna sign Kent Bazemore on a Sunday afternoon uh, or Sunday night. Uh, is well, is did, it just me? Uh, I don't maybe. know. Maybe. I mean, I was trying to think what was like the big thing that was happening this past weekend. I know it was a little warm out, and people were probably out enjoying their Sundays, but it was a Sunday. Maybe on I a supposed boat. To possibly. <laughs> supposed no news to on waiting a till, till Monday to to put your news drop out there. Um, yeah, so uh, the Sacramento Kings signed Ken Bazemore, uh, and they also signed Quinn Cook. So we do have some activity. Um, you know, I guess l- let's start with Bazemore. Um, and for that matter, let's start with the basics. If you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. Go down and subscribe. Uh, make sure you're uh, a subscriber to the Kings Beat as well. Um, premium subscriber gets you an invite to the uh, the upcoming... Um, off the record with the Kings Beat Virtual Happy Hour, which we have not announced yet, but will be coming soon. Um, but uh, Brendan, you weren't around for the Kent Bazemore era of Sacramento Kings basketball. Um, so what are your thoughts as an outside observer coming in? Um, we're talking about a veteran who hasn't played a whole lot in the last couple of years, uh, but a guy who you know, has been a, a solid NBA player. Yeah, I uh, I definitely still was keeping up with the with the team at, at that point. I just didn't get to sit next to you gentlemen at the game. But yeah, I liked Kent Bazemore during his time here. I, I think that when you're talking third string small forward, that Bazemore's fine. Like, and as long as you're not talking about Bazemore and and Quinn Cook that we'll get to later, guys that you're relying on in a, on a nightly basis, I like that these are the caliber of players that Sacramento is dealing with when it comes to filling out the end of their roster. Because previously it feels like these would be guys that they're getting and asking to play maybe a little bit bigger of a role than they should be playing at that point in their career. And I think that Bazemore in a limited role can be okay. I think as a culture guy um, is where he's intriguing to me. I don't know how much he still provides on the floor. Um, I think his defense was pretty tough from when I went and watched back some of his Lakers clips and things like that. But I, I certainly don't mind it. I'm not also annoyed if he's not at the roster come the start of the season. Yeah, Sean, uh, you were around for Kent Bazemore, and he was a breath of fresh air in the locker room. Uh, yeah. a, a great interview, um, a really passionate guy, uh, one of those self-made guys, self-made you know NBA players that worked their way into the league through uh, by hook or by crook, finding his way through you know different countries and and the G League and or the D League at that point, uh, but. Just what are your thoughts? Because you you have spent plenty of time with Kent. Yeah, I I thought that um, aside from not only his Warrior roots, but just when he came to Sacramento, um, he he was coming. It was in the final year of a pretty sizable nineteen million dollar contract. I mean, that's massive how, deal. That's yeah. how Atlanta thought about him. That's how Portland thought about him when they traded for him initially. And um, him coming to Sacramento, he he was a very quality player. I look, I realize it was only. 25 games and you know things got halted because of the pandemic and he ultimately finished things out with the kings in the bubble but i thought he was a very impactful player um it, this was a team that needed some guys in the worst way and and he he kind of brought a lot now to brennan's point you know historically 
Kent Bazemore is a very solid two-way player. He he can he he's, he provides quality depth, is what I like to call. And uh, he hasn't really been that guy uh, over the past two years because he hasn't really played a whole lot. And 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 it's not really because of injury. It's because he was on some pretty deep teams with some high aspirations to go deep into a playoff run. And obviously that did not happen uh, with the Lakers. But I think he can have a positive impact on your team. I think he's the right type of player that that fits this team and what they're hoping to do and hoping to you know crack the postseason. So uh, I like it. He's somebody I expect to be around. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily a training camp contract. I think he's somebody who will ultimately make the team and uh, hopefully have a, I don't, you know, rotationally, we'll see how that plays out, but you've got some familiarity there. I and mean, not only did he play with, you know, the likes of Malik Monk and a lot of the a good portion of the, of the players here, but he's got familiarity with Mike Brown. So um, I, I think it's a, it's a positive. It's a signing that I had thought could happen uh, weeks back, not not that I was told, but just trying to connect some dots a little bit and see like, oh, this guy I could see having an impact on this team or maybe being available and maybe have some interest um, and uh, was kind of surprised he hadn't landed with somebody yet. And to see him come to Sacramento, I think they should uh, I think they should be pretty happy to have him. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, he's your prototypical like three and D guy, super long arms, super active on the defensive end good communicator on the floor um he's a 35.6 percent three-point shooter uh he's improved in that area greatly as he's gotten older as a player um whether he he fit the teams that he went to after he left sacramento or not i don't think he really did um but i think what we're seeing is that you know the kings are looking for veterans now to fill out the like what brendan said the back end of the rotation but solid people guys that you know will have a like a personality in the locker room i talked about this last week on d'lo and casey before they they hired they they brought uh baysmore in but there was a moment when baysmore and uh anthony tolliver were both acquired right around the same time by the kings and i can't remember if it was in the same deal or not um i do remember it was uh baysmore for trevor ariza and uh i was actually in utah covering kings and Jim Patrick from Sacramento Bee had taken me out on a tour of Utah uh, of Salt Lake City because he had lived in Salt Lake City for like four or five years, and uh, we we met, we had lunch, and then he was taking me a tour. I'm like, and then you know news started to break, um, and we had to like race back. Yeah, it, it was it was wild. But uh, Basemore is one of those guys that I think he instantly stepped in and had a a huge voice in the locker room, and I very specifically remember like. It was just a couple of games into his tenure here uh, that him and Tolliver held a team meeting and said, hey, look, you guys are better than this. We don't know what's going on here, and we're on the outside looking in, but the talent level on this team is too good to to be where you guys are at, and you guys need to stop with the nonsense and, and pull together and, and start showing some life. And I thought that that was a huge part of why the Kings turned around. Uh, his play on the court was good, but... His voice in the locker room, I think, was even more powerful at that time. And that was Tolliver. You're right. Tolliver did come over that trade. I'd forgotten about that. But you're, yeah. I remember that moment. And I think the biggest message there was you're far too talented to play the stupid. And Yes. <laughs> and it, it was – it, it was kind of eye-opening for that. I don't know that, you know, I remember talking to Bayes at one point in the bubble, and before we started, a, we were just doing a Zoom interview. And before we started, he says, yeah, you know, the basketball IQ, I didn't think that I'd have to bring that to, to a team. You know, I, 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 I knew that I'm a smart player, but I didn't know that's one of the things they were going to value about me because looking around, like, there's just not a lot of basketball IQ on the team. And it was something that, I had been harping on for for years so it was almost like a misery loves company i was like oh thanks Bayes gets it and you know you get a guy like anthony tolliver who just knows tricks of the trade being a vet um and again it's not, not fault of their own i mean you just got a lot of young guys at the time so um this team is a lot more longer in the tooth than than that team was you do have some familiar pieces around him and uh yeah i i, I think it's just the right type of move uh for them and you know he may not play a whole hell of a lot. Let's just be honest, guys. Like he, he may not be that impactful of a player, but you talk about what a player can bring behind the scenes to a locker room, a practice court, training camp. Um, those will be his game days a lot of times. And I think just by 
if he's anything like the player we saw two years ago, it's going to be hard to keep him off the floor. Um, so I think he will have a, an impact. I mean, when you think about when he went to the Warriors too, he did so with aspirations of, of doing something there, but they weren't good then. You know, that that was the Warriors team that was not good uh, due to injuries and, and things like that. So uh, he, he, he knew what it was like to play for a bad team. He knew it was like to go to a team that had aspirations of being a deep postseason run that just – wasn't going to be there because of the way the injuries were. And he was a little bit of a factor there. Then you go to the Lakers and it was again, a team that wanted to go deep and didn't, they just, they, you know, you know, he had injuries and LeBron and, and AD and, and it was kind of a mess, but he saw what the type of player Malik Monk could become and, and have his best year yet. Now he gets to be a part of that here in Sacramento. And uh, hopefully they can, they can kind of duplicate that success. I think he can have a good impact on his teammates. Yeah, it's interesting, uh, Brendan. I'm gonna like feed you this. He he played with Fox, Holmes, and Barnes in Sacramento. He played with Barnes in Golden State uh, in, during his rookie season. He played with Alex Len in Sacramento, and this will be his second time playing with Alex Len in Sacramento. Also played with Alex Len in Atlanta. He played with Kevin Herter in Atlanta. He played with Malik Monk last year with the Lakers. And he was coached by Mike Brown two years ago with Golden State. He's like like six degrees of Kevin Bacon. He is, you know, six degrees of, of Kent Bazemore. Um, just what kind of impact can that have? Like familiarity, knowing everyone, everyone having a good vibe for who you are and what you do on the court, but also in the locker room. Yeah, I think a lot of the intangibles that you guys have kind of mentioned and a lot of that comes with these previously built relationships are, are kind of primarily what I'd be looking for from Bazemore. And I, I think there is a value also on the floor and having played with someone before and knowing their tendencies and the way that more often than not, I think it's Bazemore setting other people up rather than vice versa. Uh, but he's a decent cutter himself as well. And, and kind of just knowing his willingness to risk on defense. And yeah, so I think there is definitely value in that. Um, and again, I think it's a lot of the intangibles because I hate to be that guy, but he was really, really bad last year. And maybe last year is the outlier right now, but he's also 33 years old and, and could just be kind of in the twilight of his career, if not already past it. I mean, like the the Lakers had high aspirations, but I think that they could have used more depth and they could have used Kent Bazemore to be better than he was. And he could have seen a larger rotational spot there if he performed better. He only had 12 games of the 39 that he played, that he played more than 20 minutes, only 22 games that he played even 10 minutes a night. Like it's just hard to, in my mind, expect minutes from him. I think the intangibles are great. And I do think there is a lot of value in that, but I think if he's playing 15 minutes a night, they're going to be some, rough 15 minutes Sean I thought can we he were be gonna, I thought I thought we were gonna have to explain who Kevin Bacon was a second ago oh. <laughs> I know the name that's all I got though <laughs> to be honest oh, no. <laughs> I, I, was, I was gonna jump in but I was like no let's just let him just let him go sorry <laughs> no buddy. Sean's over there rocking out to foot loose waiting to see if <laughs> no. he knows who he is <laughs> he's married to Kira Sedgwick which yeah man. that's an even that nope yeah yeah uh, singles right Sean Kira Singles, Sedgwick. yeah, phenomenon. Yeah. That if you've seen that was filmed up in Auburn, so, uh, Auburn and Grass uh, Valley, yeah, movie, yeah, yeah, She's in yeah. That. Here in the lake, I, I think uh, my wife. She's met, also the uh, is it the closer that was on TNT? Yeah, the closer on TNT. Yeah, um, pretty good. Yeah, uh, phenomenon. Um, my wife actually met uh, John Travolta up here during the the filming of it. She was in high school, yeah. and the, like a bunch of the kids get to meet John Travolta. Um, Anyway, to segue back to Kent Bazemore, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Sean, can he be Iman Shumpert, like the Iman Shumpert like cheerleader guy? No, no, you don't think no. so. I mean, he'll be supportive. He'll be a good. But what you're when I, I see where you're going, and in theory, sure. But like, Shump had a swag, man. Shump had like, like he. Just think of what Shumpert represents, even to pop culture. I mean, you're married to Tiana Taylor. She's in the Kanye video. You know, she's aspiring. She's, you know, <laughs> it's like, no, like, like seriously. Like, and, and Shump is a different type of dude. We all know this, right? Like, we knew that most of us knew this before he came to Sacramento. Kings fans yeah. sure got that taste. Like, he's quirky. He, he's got a great personality. Not that 
not that Baze doesn't, but Baze carries himself more like a professional. Like, remember the if you were on the Warriors, the Baze mooring, like he'd be on the bench and he'd be doing the the point to the air, and they called they had they called it Baze mooring. Like that Baze moor is not the Baze moor you get at thirty three years old anymore. Meanwhile, Shumpert stays the same and continues to get quirkier and quirkier. Um, I think there's more of amusement, if you will, around the character that was Amon Shumpert, and that was what made him so infectious for that locker room. You contrast that to Kent Bazemore, and it's a professionalism. It's a do the right way, do this the right way, um, but it's a little bit – it's it's going to be stale and um, – boring right in contrast Mm. to what shumpert brought now again neither is necessarily wrong but i I just think that when you're looking to see the effect that shumpert had on this locker room it was beyond what he did on the court it was beyond doing things the right way because he you know he did a lot of those the right way but it was the fun factor that came with that it was oh my god this guy won a title with lebron james and is this aspiring rap star and he's married to tiana taylor and it, it's like the the story of Shump and, and his personality exceeded a lot of the things he did on the basketball court, but Shump also did and approached things the right way as well. So Bays just approaches things the right way and didn't have that. that per- he has great personality. He's an amazing golfer, by the way. Like, I feel like this guy could retire right now and probably get his tour card. Him and Steph Curry are really that good. Um, but again, I, it's different, and I see the point you were trying to get to. I think he can still have a tremendous impact on this team, especially within the locker room, but it, it's not to the level of Shumpert because it's not going to have that fun factor to it, if you will. And again, that's a good thing because this team is beyond those kids that looked up to somebody like like Amon Shumpert. You know what I mean? Like That locker room is completely different than the locker room that they have now, which is a little bit more, like I said, longer in the tooth. Those things don't matter as much. It's It's not the the aura of the NBA is, is so big. It's like, no, we have expectations of being really a really good basketball team. And that's refreshing because it's not this newness factor to where a lot of those kids in the locker room were looking around at like, wow, we're in the NBA and wow, we've got someone like Shumpert on our team. Wow. We had Vince Carter on our team the year before or whatever it was. So things like that, I feel like it's a different contrasting style, if you will. Yeah. I I also think there's an aspect real quick, James, and tell me if you agree with this of like, Bays isn't coming in and needing to change the culture in, in the way that kind of it felt like Shump did. I think Bays is coming in and just being a part of a good culture. I, I think in my mind there are, you know, like I guess you could say cultural leaders above Kent Bazemore in my mind when it comes to this team. Like Mike Brown is the first person that comes to mind. I think that Davion falls into that. Um, we'll see if he gets more vocal this year. But I think that like being a part of and contributing to a good culture is a different ask than you need to come in here and kind of turn things around. Yeah. I'll point out that when Bazemore joined the team, that's when the Kings got good that year. It also coincided with um, Luke Walton pulling the plug on the Buddy Heald as a starter experiment. Um, But they finished that season and in the, the 25 games that Bazemore played, they were 14 and 11. If you take out the bubble, they were more like 13 and 8 the in games that Bazemore played. Um, he was impactful, like on the court. And like I, I laugh at the Shumper thing because some of the Shumper stuff worked and some of it didn't. And a lot of times, like Shumper did a lot of like comedic stuff, which I thought was hilarious. The players, like most of the players, had no idea. They have no idea who Eddie Murphy was. So when he started doing his Eddie Murphy laugh and doing like coming to America lines, they were all looking at him like, what is he doing? And we're over on the side, like all the media guys. Um, it's like when we're dealing with Brendan. Yeah, I like, was going to say. Yeah, the players were Brendan. Brendan, Eddie Murphy was in life. <laughs> hey, Beverly Hills he's Cop. Donkey from Shrek. I got it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, someone needs to send Eddie Murphy that clip. That's what he's known as now, Donkey from Shrek. Um, that's awesome. Uh, but, yeah, I, I kind of feel like he can have more of an influence um, – I mean, I, I don't know if he can have the influence on the court. Shump uh, was a vibe. Shump, Shump was just a vibe, man. Like it's, it's He was for a it, long time. Yeah, that's yeah. It. and again, he gave those kids confidence. You know what I mean? Like there's Yeah. there's a there's a confidence that came with with with, with the scores and he empowered them and they they leaned into that. And it was it was again, it was a swagger, it was a style. And again, like that's not taking anything away from Bazemore like he, it's it's a just a different type of approach that he'll have. 
you could argue that maybe Bays is going to be more impactful, but you know, did we lose Brendan? Look what I happened. Don't know. Oh, we oh, did lose Brendan. We have for gremlins. A we have gremlins in this thing. We man. do have gremlins today, man. It's been a rough go. Um, <laughs> we we've had all he's kinds back. of Wi-Fi. He's back. Look, he's and back. he's back. Okay, we can't um, talk about him more. He's back. Yeah, we've had all kinds of issues. Oh, and he's on mute, oh, and he and doesn't know mute. it. He can't. He doesn't have any audio. Oh no, he hasn't he even turned on. <laughs> we might have to edit this whole thing out. Oh no, we we oh, can't no, we edit this whole it. thing out. Uh, <laughs> no, we gotta going. go now. Like we can't just keep rolling on podcasts and canceling them halfway through. Uh, we'll do empty chair, Brendan, here for a few minutes. <laughs> uh, yeah, Sean, I, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued to see how Baysmore actually. Uh, impacts and, and whether he plays or not. And um, I, I think instantly uh, the Kings have more depth after like after their two additions. They didn't bring in guys that I don't think were... Uh, they're brought in to not play, but to play if you need them type deal. And I, yeah. I think that that's, that's probably a good thing, uh, especially when you look at some of the other players that they had brought in where it's like you really don't know what you're getting. Well, in 82 games is a long, long season, and, and you you find answers and solutions, and sometimes you go with some different rotations and different gimmicks throughout the the, the, the year. And, you know, I think he will be a, a player that will have moments. I just, you know, to be part of a regular rotation, I just I don't see it, but that's what you have training camp for. We'll see if some of those things kind of fix themselves, like much like Brendan's uh, audio, hopefully. Yeah, you can he's... say anything you want about him right now. He'll have no idea. It's so great. But we can see the look on his face. That's great. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, Sean, uh, yeah. the other addition this weekend um, is, is of course, Quinn Cook. Go do uh, Well, that was on Monday, Quinn Cook. And uh, Quinn Cook's been around the block a little bit. He was around Sacramento last year. I think he played 12 games in Stockton. Um, Brennan, are you back? I'm back. Wow. Hey. My wow. mic did not appreciate you guys for a second there, but I'm back. No, I didn't. Yeah, that was random and weird. Um yeah, we finished with Kent Basemore while you were uh you were away, Brendan. Um uh, and we're we're transitioning to uh Quinn Cook. Um Is he going to probably wear number 26 again, you think you think? Cuz I don't think there was ever another t- number 26 in Kings history. Who Basemore? Yeah. Oh, that's a Remember good question. Remember when he was 20 he was 26 when he was uh and he wore 26 with the Warriors, so I really like that's only an, 26 that's in an King's interesting history. i gotta double uh, check that i can find that yeah yeah that's that's an interesting question um i, I think uh we'll figure that oh. one out um but yeah. quinn cook jeremy uh, lamb might have wore it <gasps> man I probably i was yeah do you duke too oh do <laughs> you remember the do you duke era duke yeah, <laughs> he was a good kid. I'm not quite sure how he made it into an NBA locker room, but I don't uh, either. <laughs> he was like living the life. <laughs> it was it was an interesting time to have. Uh, that was the early eight, uh, stages of Vlade Divac's career, where uh, bringing in guys that you, like eh, I don't know. I was intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't um, want to sign James. James could probably do what he does. He, yeah, I probably <laughs> could have. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not tall enough, but yeah. Um, but Quinn Cook is a guy, yeah. I, I, I'm surprised, 40.8% career three-point shooter, which is sort of the theme of the offseason, right? If you can shoot, the Kings will hire you. Um, but uh, it, does this, is he going to battle uh, with uh, Matthew Della Vadova for that third point guard spot? Yeah, probably. I mean, I expect them both kind of to be quote-unquote camp meet, if, if for lack of a better term term um like again as we've talked about before i don't know what to expect from del vadova delhi is a guy that i don't I, I don't know what to expect honestly and when you look at someone like quinn cook like i i got to see him up close in person in g league he was very 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 uh, appreciative of the opportunity to, to be in stockton i think it's because he saw what that there that some of the options had been drying up but i think he also played very very well and I know it's G League, and I know, you know, we saw him sitting courtside at, at Vegas uh, for that game I and mean, after working out with the Kings, and Delhi was right there with him. Um, I think that what I would expect to happen is he's a guy who's, again, familiar with, with Mike Brown. He's going to compete. Solid, solid pro, four-year starter at Duke, and uh, he's, he's a two-time champion, and he's kind of 
been a good fit on some pretty decent teams, albeit not playing a whole hell of a lot. So um, good locker room guy, good teammate, and I feel like uh, he's professional, but I ultimately think he could find himself back in the G League again waiting for another opportunity. He, training camp is going to be very, very imperative for him, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we don't have the specifics on his contract yet, but, uh, you know, still, I think it's a solid, solid signing of, you know, he's not going to change anything, but he is going to get add some depth, um, like what, what Sean talks about, the quality of depth. These are guys that have NBA experience, that if you need them to sit on the bench for a while, that they're okay with that. They understand sort of what's happening, but if you need them to play, they also stay prepared and they're ready to go and they're appreciative of the moment. So um, to me at 29, he seemed like he had a few more options than Della Vadova. And so maybe that's why it took longer to sort of center in and actually get him to sign a contract um, because he was looking at other options first. Um, but I think that that should be a pretty strong training camp battle. And worst case scenario, I think Della Vadova might slide into uh, more of like an assistant coach, uh, you know, type or player development coach uh, type um, position with Sacramento if if that, in fact, opens up. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I do like Cook more than Della Vadova. You mentioned the 40.8% career three-point shooter, and Sean talked about his time with Stockton last year. I mean, those numbers are ridiculous. He played 11 games, um, 35.3 minutes, 23 and a half points, 5.9 assists. Um, there's a few turnovers in there, but 6.8 three-point attempts per game, and he knocked down 44% of them. Like, to me... I think the fact that you know you're getting a really good three-point shooter puts him above Delhi because I don't know anything that I feel confident I can say you're going to get from Delhi on a nightly basis. I guess energy, but I don't know how much that would translate on, on the floor. Like, I don't know if he's still able to move in the way that he was defensively. So I really think that that three-point shooting that Quinn Cook provides is, is valuable. And obviously, you know, last episode, I, I think I kind of... I clearly very much value spacing, but I, I think either way, obviously these guys are only playing in a pinch, and I, I think I like that you know that you're getting that for sure with Cook, and Delhi's more of a wild card to me. Yeah, he kind of reminds me of Yogi Ferrell. Like, there's going to be that every once in a while you might have a game that gets out of control or a game where the team just comes out flat and you need someone to come in and provide some energy, and maybe he can be that guy. I'm not sure. Uh, either way, I mean, we all know that De'Aaron Fox is going to play, you know, 35, 36 minutes a night, that Davion Mitchell is going to play close to 30. Uh, there's not a lot of time that uh, at that backup point guard. So I like that they're bringing in uh, sort of these these camp guys that, that can battle. Um, and I don't know how much guaranteed money there is. I know with Del Vadova, you know, I think what we've heard is like 250 to show up and, or and then another – or 250 if he's on opening night roster, and then it doesn't become guaranteed until January 7th, January 9th, right around there. Um, I, I think Quinn Cook could be looking at something similar, and he might even be a guy that would accept, uh, if he doesn't make the team, would accept a, a stint at Stockton to go down and sort of help you run that, and then be a guy that can bounce back up if you, if you have some body, if you need some bodies at some point during the season. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. If you, if you guys were, uh, a betting man, uh, Quinn Cook, or or Del Vadova makes a roster. Mm. Well, I mean, I still have a big question mark for for Del Vadova, but if he can be the type of player he was five years ago, sure, he makes the team. But I have doubts about that, so I'm going to lead him towards Quinn Cook. Brendan is muted again. Whoops, I'm here. I'm going with <laughs> Quinn Cook as well. I, I think again, it's just the spacing to me. I, I think the fact that like. I almost think I can say that Quinn Cook's an elite shooter and just having an elite skill specifically being shooting is intriguing to me as a third stringer. His toughest part is that he's 6'1". And, right. you know, Del Deli will have two inches, I believe. Deli 6'3", I think. Uh, he'll have two inches on him. But, um, you know, depending upon what type of lineups you want to go with, I, I know that's always kind of been a, a knock on him. But he's, he's gotten so much better. His handle's gotten a lot better. Um, I think he still makes some pretty – rash decisions at times but um you know that can also be just a byproduct of not really knowing your teammates if you tend to look at some of the turnover numbers that he had so um he's you know even his last before he went to went to Stockton his last NBA stint 
he had like he went from the Lakers and he was a um you know, I remember a lot of players being really happy to see him with paired with LeBron and and that type of team and then he was let go and he had like two 10-day contracts with Cleveland, which is ironically where he started his career. So, um yeah, man, it'll be it'll be interesting to see just, you know, what he can what he can come away with, take from what he had with Stockton, have this fresh new opportunity. And even if he ends up back in the G League again, if he ends up getting cut, uh, see if someone picks him up. And if not, he, he could have another opportunity with the G League and maybe find himself called up at some point to a, to another team. Okay, so uh, last week we, we did um, a fun well, what's new your, segment. What's your guess, James? Uh, my, my guess is Cook. My, like, if you're going to keep three-point guards, that, that Cook is the guy. But that's just, you know, again, I think we need to see who Della Vadova is. He does have an edge. He does have a personality. Um, you know, I, I think he can actually bring something to the table if there's anything left in the tank. I know Queen Cook still has something left in the tank. And so I, I think he's a guy that instantly comes in. I, I think competition, competition during training camp is a good thing. And, you know, sort of... Uh, you know, iron sharpens iron type deal. And uh, so I, I'm hoping that uh, we see some good position battles because we talked about on, you know, one of the pods last week, the the shooting guard position. But I think, you know, we're starting to look at not just the point guard, the back of the third point guard deal, but also if we're, we start looking at Bazemore and what that means for Chima Moneki and Casey Akpala and all guys like that. Um, you know, I, I think it does... Uh, it, it makes camp a little more intriguing because there there are some guys who are going to be fighting for positions, and uh, that's always a good thing in my book. Um, yeah, uh, last week we did. Uh, Brendan came up with a new thing, uh, factor cap, and uh, it it's fun. It's a fun segment, and I, I think we're gonna hand it over to Brendan. Brendan, what do you got for us? Fact or cap? Yeah, I got to do something fancy with my voice, I guess, huh, if I'm going to have my own segment here. Um, I, I have three different <laughs> factor caps for you guys. Apparently, it's a requirement. It seems to be. First one, you mentioned Moneki and how I think the Bazemore is – that that's kind of who he's in competition with in my mind when it comes to that third small forward and, and kind of because the Kings will have to cut two of the guys that they have now for the start of the regular season. And in my mind, that's a little bit of a battle. So – this one revolves around Moneki and factor cap, Mr. Sean Cunningham. Chimo Moneki will be on an NBA roster next season. Yeah, I think that's uh, at some point in the season. Do we want to say that? Or are we saying like he makes an opening day roster? I guess at some point in the season. I, I don't think that I would count G League. But right. regular yeah, season I wouldn't roster. Either, but I, I, yeah, I do think he will be uh, a member of an NBA team at some point next year. And you were the or one that had said he had season. other options, right? Yeah, he had definitely had Utah and uh, Minnesota were the two other teams that I knew of that were uh, interested in the guy's services for sure. I started watching a little bit more of him recently and was really uninspired. I was uh, disappointed <laughs> By the defensive effort, <laughs> shots fired. Right. out here catching. I strays. hate to be that guy, Jesus. but I just didn't. I, I didn't love it. Didn't love it. Um, James, James, James didn't get a chance. Shima Moneki will be on an NBA roster next year. Yeah, factor cap. Yeah, I think that there's going to be a really interesting battle at for that. Uh, like, I don't know if it's the third, second, third, whatever we're going to call the small forward position. I think Kevin Herter is the backup three behind uh, Harrison Barnes right now. He'll start at the two and be the backup three. Um, and they'll have sort of an eight or nine man rotation that's pretty tight. Um, but when it comes to who's going to play the, the extra minutes whenever those come, um, which they seem to come a lot in Sacramento because y you get blown out quite often. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm looking at that position. It's tough. Uh, I want to see what Casey Akpala has. Uh, to offer as well. And I think Bazemore is a lock for a roster spot. I think there'll be a battle between Quinn Cook and Del Vadova for a roster spot. And then I think it might come down to Casey Akpala versus Chima Moneki. And I don't know who wins that battle. So um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Cap because 
I, I think it's really hard to go from overseas for a long time and then just show up and make it to the NBA, uh, especially for a guy who really wasn't on a lot of people's radars throughout his college career. Um, you know, he's had a good run in Europe, but, you know, kind of under the radar in Europe as well. So um, the the length and athleticism of Casey Akpala to me is really intriguing. And I I think it might come down to who do you think would get claimed and go somewhere else as opposed to who will accept a G League offer and go sit down in the G League and try to make their way to the league that way. Yeah, yeah. and if something uh, like that were to happen, I could see him doing like a 10-day as well um, with – with could be, you know, different team, who, who knows. But um, I, think he, I think he will have an opportunity. And I know with, with Brendan not liking what he's seen, I remember just covering him in Davis. He played a different role. You know, I mean, he was a primary scoring option – and you come to, you know, I, I remember thinking, I hope to see him at, at, at a summer league team one day. And then when he went to go play overseas, I said, good. I figured that's kind of where he would make his money and make his mark. And I never really thought he'd become an NBA player. But I think it's just by virtue of what he did with not only Nigeria, but overseas last year and kind of the role he plays. Because he's, um, he's a guy who really embraces the physicality of the game the toughness of the game, doing everything that sometimes doesn't show up in the box score. Um, and he's got a, he's got a really, he's just a really bright guy and he gets it. I think he sees the game really, really well, has some nice footwork to him as of being a former soccer player. Um, you know, I think I, I see it. And I, I think that's, you know, we always like to say that there's, there's no blueprint. I'm thrilled for his opportunity. I'm glad it's here in Sacramento because there's some familiarity. It gives some people a sense of to, to be able to root for somebody like that. But um, yeah, I mean, if it would it shock me if he didn't make the NBA this year, no, but I think this is the right time for him. I really do. I feel like he's, he's going to have an opportunity uh, by just some of those things. And I think it's coming at the right time because if this was something that happened years ago, he'd have, you know, he'd have been washed out already. I, I think the whole context and what his role is, is really important. And I want to go watch some of those uh, Nigerian national games because lucky enough to have um, games with him specifically under what is going to be Sacramento's head coach and more members of their coaching staff. So kind of want to see how he looked different in that compared to the overseas setting where he's a little bit more featured, which obviously isn't going to happen. Um, at, at the NBA level, specifically on the offensive end. And like, I thought it was like engagement on defense that I was uh, left me wanting more. And I, I would think that playing under Mike Brown, that would be a non-negotiable. So I, I do think that there could be something there. But to me right now, he feels like the odd man out. I, I w just looking at the rotation and having to make cuts, he's the first one that personally I would probably look at. And then one of, of Deli or Cook. So I'm going to say cap as well, but I think that he could get a chance with another team. It's just, in my mind, Sacramento, he, he makes sense to kind of be the odd man out right now. So what was that? Was that for Sacramento or was that for NBA? I think you said No, it was, it was NBA. NBA. It was for okay. NBA. Yeah. So make sure I understood the question. I also say, um, you know, if you remember the, the, the game against the U.S., now that was, it was an exhibition, of course, but you'll be able to find that game probably pretty easily on YouTube. But, um, watch that fourth quarter especially when he comes in uh that's where things shift and look it was Gabe Vincent making a lot of the a lot of the offensive plays and scoring the buckets but a lot of them were as a result of the defense and some of the physicality that Moneki provided so um those are those are just I think I think this staff particularly when you have someone like Mike Brown Jordy Jordy Fernandez and and uh, Luke Laux who are all very much familiar with his game this is a move that they wanted. I think this is something that they pursued on their own and tried to bring to the table for, for the Kings. And again, it could be just somebody to, to push in training camp and get the message across and, and whatever. But if he ends up in the G league or if he ends up whatever, I think it, that'll also be something that they would like to have around their, or, their organization. Uh, as remember, if you, Gabe Vincent famously had the exhibit 10 contract with Vladi here in Sacramento. So ended up playing in the G League, never really ended up playing for the Kings. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those little unorthodox paths to the NBA. So I do think he'll end up in the NBA at some point this year. Um, will, he, will he step into a game will that, that I, I don't have an answer there. So, yeah, I go, I go fact. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll add to that too. While you're watching those games, watch 
Akpala and what they how they used him with the Nigerian yeah. national team because he was out in front defending guards at six eight with like a seven two seven three wingspan. I mean, he was it is also just such a different game, though, right? Like, yeah, I think anyone listening to us, if they if they go, wow, you know, you see some of the physicality that you can get away with in, in FIBA, and then you go and and you have to understand like you can't really do a lot of that in the NBA. So hand checking, all that kind of stuff. Like there's a little bit of a, of a different game that's being played. So um, you have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt because the international game is a lot, a lot more physical. Next one I got for you guys. Factor cap. Chemezi Metu will be a part of the rotation on opening night. I think that he is probably on the outside looking in right now. And I, it's interesting to me. I wonder if there's any contemplating if he's the one that gets cut before the season ends up starting because I think there is a way you can look at it and think that Sacramento has a lot of fours. If you want to say that Barnes and Murray can play that, that, that there is still Trey Lyles there as well. I, I think Akpala could qualify as a four. Is Rashawn Holmes going to play the four sometimes? Um, so a guy that had a little bit of an inconsistent role next year Mr. James Ham, Factor Cap, Chemezi Metz, who will be a part of the rotation on opening night. Cap. I, I just, like, I like Mezzi. Um, I think he's got a good spirit to him. Uh, he's one of the more athletic players on the Kings roster. But I think between what you just said, that I think Keegan Murray's going to play a ton. I think that Harrison Barnes going to still play plenty of minutes at the four because we know they've got to steal minutes to get all the guards' minutes. Uh you know, to get the, to keep them happy as far as Monk and, and Herter. Uh, and then um, I just think of Trey Lyles, if you do need to play a guy there, he's more refined at this point. And if it's about wins and not about player development, then he's the guy that probably gets the look because he's a better shooter. He's a guy that you can run the ball through. He's a wide body that can rebound. And uh, so I'm going to say that, um, it, it's going to be very difficult for Chemezi Metu to earn uh, a rotational spot. Yeah, I think we had this conversation a little while ago too. Like, I think he's going to have an opportunity to do so. I don't think it'll be opening night. Um, I, I would kind of agree there. So, yeah, I think it is capped that he is impactful on opening night. I think as the season unwinds, he'll have opportunity to be impactful. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I still think this team is, is a little – it's got more balance for sure than it did when it closed out last season. That's like just inar- inarguable. That's just a fact. But I do feel like it's still a little bit wonky, and I think there's areas to improve. And I think, you know, it's primed to be a team that could make a, a move. Um, I know we're going to kind of get to that later on, you know, whether or not you can be a part of something bigger like a KD trade where you're a third or fourth team or an option that can provide something in, in, in that way. But, um, you know, I think Mezzi will have opportunity. I just don't necessarily see see that happening on opening night. I think some things have to kind of go his way, be it an injury, be it a beating somebody out. Like if you literally put him up against somebody like Trey Lyles, um, what does that look like? And I think there's, you know, most people would probably bet on Trey Lyles. I'm not so sure that I'm one of them, to be honest. But um, I, I, I do feel like at some point in the season, like he'll have – an opportunity to crack the rotation. And I think he can have a, a good impact. I'd like to see if he can sustain it, but in terms of opening night, I just don't think it'll be that soon. If that makes sense. It does. That's, that's where I'm at as well. I, I would lead Lyles over Mezzi. And I think that's kind of the conversation when it comes to opening night. And I, I think it's all matchup and maybe situationable. If you want a little bit more athleticism that you can I mean, look can't towards we, Mezzi. Can't, we could probably also see something where neither one of them play, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just... Especially if Holmes plays minutes at the four. Mm-hmm. Between Holmes and Barnes and Keegan Murray, I-, I think, you know, that's a lot of players already that you're going to have to squeak minutes out at the four. Do you guys think there's any chance that Mezzi doesn't make it past training camp? And it's you possible. prefer someone like Monecki? Yeah, it's possible. Um, I think there's a couple, a couple scenarios, you know, especially if he comes into camp and he's just maybe dealing with an injury or he's not quite there. I think he has to really impress in camp to, you know, show that he's a, uh, has made strides, you know, he's got to show improvement. So I think it's possible. I think all, all cards are on the table, but if I was a betting man, I think he'd be a part of the rotation. I think he will be a part of the team and possibly part of a rotation at some point this year. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, his contract, I believe, is guaranteed now um, because they picked it up. At, they had a certain point. So, it, yeah, it's guaranteed at $1.9 million. And um, so, I mean, you already have him under contract yeah. where some of these other guys you don't have under contract um, or at least, you know, they're not on fully guaranteed deals. Uh, I would assume that he'll be on the roster. That's just my own personal thing, but uh, you never know. I think still there's plenty to be determined between now and and you know September 27th or whenever uh, uh, media day and training camp starts. Yeah, definitely. Next one I have for you guys, or I guess just to clarify, we all said cap, right? Chemezi Metu being a part of the rotation opening night. All right. Cap. Next one. This was inspired. Rashawn Holmes tweeted, "Reinvention is a beautiful thing," and in my mind, that's teasing the three-point push shot. Uh, clearly, we he's a four, and Sean. A dude's tweet. We have to. Do you know what time of year it is, Sean? I know. Sorry. Um, Go ahead, buddy. So I originally was going to start with uh, Rashawn Holmes three-point attempts, but decided that that was a little bit out there and went with Demontis Sabonis instead. Factor cap that Demontis Sabonis will average at least two three-point attempts per game next season. And real quick, during his time in Indiana last year, he averaged 2.3. During the 15 games he played with the Kings, it was only 1.1. Um, and all of the year prior in Indiana, 2.6. Factor cap, uh, Sean Cunningham, DeMontis Sabonis will average at least two three-point attempts per game next year. That's your best question, buddy. That is your best question this 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 for this podcast because I think that's a really good number. Uh, and I think it's hard. I really think that's a hard one, especially considering the shooting that they've – provided around him now so it could be a little tougher for him to take those shots I think if he does it that means he will have checked the box that I want to see of Demonis Sabonis being a little bit more selfish so by that I think that could happen I think that will happen I think I will bet on that I think I will say that he will average two but I can completely see it not happening in which case it would make me very unhappy <laughs> If I was a Kings fan, because I want to see, I want to see Demona Sabonis be an aggressive scoring option on the Sacramento Kings, and and as brilliant as he is as a distributor, playmaker, the way he sees the floor, um, I think he realizes that he has to be a very uh, important scoring option for this team. I agree one hundred percent with Sean. Um, I actually think he can get a little higher than two. I would say he can get 2.5, three, uh, three point a, attempts per game. And the reason I think that is because you're going to have a lot of, a lot of players pushing forward on the team this year. Uh, a lot of like either fast break or just transition action on this team where they're pushing the tempo. And if he is the trailer, he's going to have plenty of opportunity to line up sort of the step in two threes. Uh, at the top of the key and if he can hit those it changes everything i i think if he can be an efficient even if it's like 34 percent three-point shooter 35 percent around there he makes the king's offense so dangerous because now you can run the ball through him in the post in the high post and at the top of the key uh, behind the three-point line and it just creates that second layer of spacing that you haven't had and uh, so if he if he actually takes that into consideration and, and you know, uses the green light that I know he's going to have, then I think he can be just absolutely dominant. And uh, I think that he will at least shoot two. And I'm going to put that number higher, considerably higher. Well, what's considerably higher? Well, three is still considerably higher in my book when it comes to, you know, a guy who averaged 1.1 for the Kings last year. Um, but I, I could definitely see three, three, three point attempts per game, especially if he's going to play with Rashawn Holmes, he's got to shoot it. He's got, Is that he possibly a roundup though? Like if it's 2.7 and you just round up to three or yeah, do you think maybe. it's a solid three? Yeah. I, I mean, somewhere in the middle there. Um, yeah, I, I think he, he could do two, eight, two, nine, three, three, two. Like, I, I think he can get that type of opportunity and that will just make the Kings that much better because, uh, if you're. If you can get this rotation up to like eight guys who shoot the three well, or at least at a competent level, and that means if Fox and Davion also take a leap forward, um, 
then you're looking at you know again you got you got Barnes you got Murray you've got Herter you've got Monk like all of a sudden you start putting together a team that can really shoot it and and that will actually I think it'll open opportunities for others um so if you can get that kind kind of three point like not just shots but accuracy out of you know seven or eight of your guys it could open the door where you can go to a guy like Casey Akpala and play him for stretches because you can use his defense and not worry about his three-point shooting and it could open the door for you know Chima Moneki it could like I think that that's kind of the key to unlocking the rest of the roster it's interesting to me I, I can see it I am going with Cap, though. I think that you can still see the 22-point-per-game DeMontis Sabonis without him shooting threes. I think that I love his touch around the basket and his playmaking. I think he's a threat going downhill. I think at very least, like, that mid-range, I want to see him pull a little bit more often when you're playing through him, like, at the elbow, that defenses can't just sag off of him. I want him to just punish defenses when they're giving him that shot a little bit more often but I don't think that I want Sabonis shooting three triples a game and unless he has com- improved to kind of the percentages that you were talking about James which I think would be a pretty significant jump in my mind but I, I think that he's just so valuable around the basket and I-, I think that there is a lot of spacing on this team I, I think that the time you're going to see Sabonis threes in my mind or when he's also sharing the floor with Fox. And it'll be interesting to see just how split that is because Fox could use the spacing for Sabonis to, uh, for him to provide that, you know, they're both guys that want to get downhill and like a pick and pop might be ideal for De'Aaron. So that way there's more room Um, and Sabonis pulling his defender out to the three point line and De'Aaron can get downhill. So I think there's moments like Sabonis, I would want him to pull it when he's open But at the same time, I think that he's so much more valuable down low that you can really just feed him down there. And if the threes come within the flow of the offense here and there, then sure. But in my mind, like just so much of his game, he can can average that 22 and be the more aggressive guy that Sean wants without the threes in my mind. Yeah, you know, it's funny. James mentioned that like the walk up three. I could also see like the very Brad Miller-esque three where, you know, both of them are working out of free throw extended and they kick it down and if it loops back out and all he's done is taken a step back beyond the three point arc and it comes back to him and he just pulls the trigger straight away. Like I can I can kind of envision that type of three pointer uh being in the repertoire and kind of but I think as you mentioned and I'm glad you mentioned it with the opportunity with having with Fox, like I kinda wonder what that rotationally would look like if he's like I, like I can see moments where he wouldn't have those that that opportunity based off of certain people on the floor, if that makes sense. Like I kind of agree. I think having Fox on that on the floor leads to an opportunity like that. But as you said, yeah, I mean his bread is buttered right in that key, right around the hoop. He's got such a nice touch um, that it's almost automatic. Like and that's the things that I would get frustrated with last year is him not be as aggressive from a scoring standpoint around the hoop as much as I'd like to see, especially for a guy who can get to the free throw line and be pretty solid from the free throw line. And this team doesn't really have a lot of that. So um, I'm with you, Brendan. I just, you know, I do think that, that too, with the way, especially if they want to play faster, I just think that if, if he has it in his mind where he's got to put shots up and I want him to think that, that I think that it'll lead to perimeter shooting and, and just having a moment or two to be able to perimeter shoot. And I think, at the end of the season, you'll see it hover right around two. Yeah. yeah. I mean, last season he shot, uh, I think I just looked, 125 threes. Um, yeah, 125 threes on the season. And I'm just going to venture a guess that the reason why that number wasn't higher in Sacramento was because he wasn't hitting them. And he felt like, you know, being a new teammate, if you're not hitting your shots, you don't take them um, from from three and so I, I think he'll have a lot more confidence coming into the season. And I was looking to, like, Nikola Jokic throughout his career, right around, like, between 3.3 3 and 3.7 threes per game. I think we're going to see a lot of the same actions. Like, he, I don't think Sabonis will score like Jokic did, but I think we'll see a lot of the same actions, especially where last year they were doing a bunch of, you know, 
elbow elbow extended looks where fox and him were playing off each other if you can bump that out to the three-point line and you have you know it just opens everything up and initially teams are going to sag off of him to take the you know the the screen guy that he's working with uh and sort of take away some of that option but if he can turn around and fire the three it just makes him like incredibly dangerous so um okay so we uh we're kind of on sort of the same page with most of those uh i like the factor cap it's a cool segment especially during the during the summer months when things are quiet uh in brooklyn things aren't quiet though uh and we just have this this new well the situation uh has been hanging out there forever the kevin durant issue uh where are you guys at with this latest twist and turn in the kevin durant saga where he has told ownership that it's either him or it's like it's steve nash and uh and and the gm either either you choose them or you choose me and the owner seems to have chosen (laughs) to stick with with the guys who have got him in this situation the situation made me really appreciate that vivek doesn't tweet out his basketball decisions (laughs) oh that's that's a good point brendan yet (laughs) <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> I was going to say fact. <laughs> uh, yeah, where are we at with this? Because this is going to open a door again for more things to happen. And I, I think it might be the door that the Kings were waiting for. Not that they're going to get Kevin Durant, but that this has become a, a, a crazy, wild, like potentially like game changing thing that's going to happen. And the Kings could get in as a third or fourth team if they really are hell bent on, on going out there and and changing, making that one last big move to change the the roster. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's an interesting situation that Nets management Nets management is in. Seemingly, like I don't really care all too much for Steve Nash, at least like what we've seen so far. To be honest, I think more so when it's like, oh, it's Nash and Marks or me. To me, that decision comes down to Kevin Durant versus Sean Marks. And I think that Sean Marks has shown the ability to build a pretty good team and that he's a quality executive in my mind. I, I think that he's done solid in years prior. I really liked that that D-Lo led team and thought that they were solid and think they've done an okay job kind of developing guys and, and making decent draft picks and things like that. So I think it's an interesting situation to be in uh i I guess definitely quite the pickle because kevin durant's obviously a generational talent but i think if it opens the door for the kings to get in and can you snag away someone like a royce o'neill or something which is probably high asks but uh even like a kessler edwards or something like that that it's intriguing and it's it's nice to have another team be the focus of kind of what everybody i guess is is laughing at and and wishing that they were not them and rather than it being the Kings this time around. I was thoroughly entertained yesterday because not only do you have the report with such detail about the way Kevin Durant and this meeting in London and all this stuff like that, that was fascinating. But then you get the owner to come out and say what he did on Twitter. And uh, that was fun. Then you see like just the politics that be, I guess ESPN kind of ignored it until, uh, Mr. Sai tweeted <laughs> and then and then they they had to kind of give the athletics some love for uh and Sham Sharanya for uh, some love for breaking that story but then like kudos New York Post like you've got this story about Kyrie Irving and you know kind of double down on on some of those thoughts about not only Sean Marks but even Steve Nash which I thought was weird um coming from the likes of Kyrie Irving so uh it's just a freaking mess over there in Brooklyn and I think if you're the Kings you want to try to attach yourself to this because there is some, there is, there is quality talent over there. I think there's going to be, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be fun to see who can kind of attach themselves to a deal. Maybe it's no one you're getting from Brooklyn. Maybe it's somebody else like a Miami or a, you know, a, a God, who knows? I mean, <laughs> at this point, there's so many rumors of, of, of who would want, I, I look at what we've talked about for the past few shows, which is, Look at what Rudy Gobert and Gobert and the and the Timberwolves just did. I mean, that was crazy. That's a crazy trade. What's it going to be like for someone like Kevin Durant? Can you even pull off a deal like that? I don't think you can do it with just 
one just one and two teams like it's going to be a crazy blockbuster so um I, I feel like at this point there's no way that they can just go into the season with both these guys on their roster I guess you could and just keep them away from your team whatever it's just going to be a big big distraction and I think the moment when they can maybe strike and pull somebody away from there um be it Brooklyn or another team I think you're going to try and to attach yourself to it that's what being aggressive is and doing due diligence and try to strike while the iron's hot and make your team better but man from just a basketball standpoint like it's drama but it's like really exciting drama to where i'm popping popcorn i want to see this whole thing play out like it's gonna have a trickle down (laughs) effect on this league and we need it right now man like it's august let's 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 spice this thing up a bit before we get euro baskets too far is too far away so let's get things going now, I, I missed the New York Post. Was it Kyrie throwing uh, shade towards uh, Marks and, and Nash as well? Yeah, it was a it was a uh, a reporter who a source told Josh Kosman that, and I got the quote right here, Kyrie Irving hates these guys. He feels that Nash is terrible and Marks is bad. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, no he missing did, man. That. I was just... I was just blown away. Trade for those guys. So, I mean, (laughs) like, I don't think it can be an either or. But like, honestly, like, you have an owner who comes out and says these things, but yet, is it? it, Maybe it's just me. What happens when he goes? Oh, oh, this guy's untradeable. We're not trading him. They trade him, right? (laughs) Like sometimes they like you see it happen in every sport all the time. It's the kiss of death, right? Um, Maybe this is the kiss of death where it's like, oh no, I stand by my staff. Three weeks from now, Steve Nash has been let go as the the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets. And maybe that's because you couldn't consummate a a fair deal to your liking. And and look, I don't know how anybody can can put Steve Nash aside. Like Sean Marks, look at the – I think we talked about this, James, uh, in a podcast earlier this year. He's had so much talent through there. But he's also done so and been able to move guys. Like – you moved, you've traded for James Harden, crazy trade, whatever. It were it 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 actually came to fruition. You get Kev, James Harden, and then you move him, and you get this Ben Simmons deal, and these just massive, massive trades that have happened. Like, I don't think it's for lack of trying on Sean Marks' part. I think he's done his job. I don't. I think you could argue that maybe these aren't the moves you have to make. But when you're in Brooklyn and you've got an owner that has Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving, and and you've made these, you know. You've made a lot of uh, moves to to be this this dominating upper echelon team in the NBA, and you're just not. So now, do you double down again and, and try to be like, hey, we got KD, we got Kyrie Irving, we got to bet on the talent? Sean Marks has done his part. I think he's. I, I've been pretty impressed with the way they've been able to move guys in and out of there. Now, I may not have agreed with the moves, but how hard it is to to pull off a trade not only for James Harden. And then move James Harden, but for Ben Simmons, you, you you've got Kyrie Irving, you've got Kevin Durant. This is all under Sean Marks' watch. Like, I think most people would have bet that something good would have happened, and it just hasn't. So, um, I would still bet good money on Sean Marks to be able to make a move. Now, Steve Nash is a head coach. I get it. Like, that's a completely different. That's a completely different argument. Like, you have a GM in place who has mortgaged and gone out and gotten the talent. And it just hasn't worked from on the basketball standpoint side of things. So if if you're circling Steve Nash and say this guy ain't it, I might be inclined to believe with you. Believe you. Does it um, when when you look at the way that it's playing out now? Does it change who they are? Because I mean, we all we all know that if Utah trades Donovan Mitchell, like it's Tank City, like they're gonna have a fire sale with the rest of the guys. But if Brooklyn has to trade. Durant, aren't you looking for just like a massive haul of draft picks and like resetting? Or do you think you can do it on the fly? I, I guess the the Celtics deal is the one that we'll keep looking at. Can they can they go get Brown? Can they get somebody from the Celtics that's like a high end all star level player? Uh, but like it feels like that team is is melting down, and I just don't know how they they pull out of what they're. Like, can you realistically 
reset the roster and think that you're still going to be competitive when you lose Durant and you might have to bail on Kyrie and like all of these things happening at one time? I think you can. It just depends on like what level of competitive we're talking about. I don't think that there's a world where there's still a championship contender like they probably should be with Kevin Durant. But I, I think that if you're talking like Jalen Brown, uh, you know, who knows if, if that's a scenario that would actually happen from Boston's point of view. But like a uh, OG Ananobi, I, I think that if you're still looking at Ananobi, um, whatever additional piece to say, it's Gary Trent Jr. as well. Um, and you're working with draft picks. There's still Ben Simmons on the roster. Royce O'Neal is still there. I, I think there are some other intriguing pieces on the outside. Like, is TJ Warren going to be anything? Uh, he wait. It was a long time before he signed anywhere, so I don't have the most confidence in his health. But I still think like, and, and whatever you would get for Kyrie Irving. And if you wanted to still be decent right now, then those draft picks can be flipped. So like, I think they're still a competitive team when they move on from these guys, if they do. But I, I certainly don't think that it's like home home court advantage in the first round or anything like that. I mean, you're talking about moving arguably the best player in the NBA, and that's who's under team control for the next like what is four it, years? Three years, four years. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. And I know he makes a ton of money, but this isn't Rudy Gobert, and look what they just got. And I don't think if you're Brooklyn and and with respect, like I just, of course they're going to go in there and be like, you got to give me the farm but it's like really how what, what can you get what can you get you know what i mean like there's a big difference gonna... when you're looking for four first round picks and when you're looking for an all-star and three competitive rotational players so you can you can remain relevant it's a big difference and and remain relevant like i just don't see it <laughs> i don't like even if you make that boston trade and and whatever the picks look like like okay great you can be competitive you can still you know have your future somewhat in the hands of some draft picks whatever get some if you can get some but all these teams that are making moves with you are pretty decent teams already so they're not going to have really high value picks in a way you know what i mean like these are still going to be pretty low at least for the next not year great. or two yeah so like, i don't know man like it's i just don't see if you're brooklyn and granted you're going to go in there and you're going to expect a haul but how do you get better like how how do you get better? Like how do you how do you not look at Kevin Durant in the face and just go, I, I can't do it. <laughs> like I can't move you because you're too valuable. You, you I know, know this is a players' that? league, but you walk in and you change the name plates on your head coach and your right. general manager. Well, and, and again, it is still a players' league. Yes. And, how, and, uh, I mean, how do you how you're hoping to maybe salvage maybe one of the relationships, not two. You know, you're hoping to say to Kevin Durant, we're going to, you know, but, but at the same point, like you're, you're the Brooklyn Nets and, and what do you say to the rest of the league when, when he's put out this ultimatum and you've got to go out and do it. And that's what I'm saying. Like you can go out and say, you know, we, we're backing our staff, but then who's going to be surprised two, three weeks from now when they make a move and yeah. the move well is like firing one of Sean Marks or Steve Nash, if not both. And part of what's so weird with this dynamic is that, like, want to be able to look at Sean Marks' decisions and, you know, give him credit where credit is due and critique where that feels fair as well. But there's almost, like, seemingly a gray area with some moves, right? Like, DeAndre Jordan, how are you going to give Sean Marks a hard time? Because that was seemingly something that just came with KD. If you were going to have KD, that that had to happen. Like, my impression is that, like would would the James Harden move had still been made if there wasn't a previous relationship there like it, it's hard to gauge how much of this was because of Kevin Durant not even the decisions of Sean Marks if I'm if I'm the Nets I really have to look at at trading him and it be I mean he makes 44.1 million this year 46.4 next year 49.9 in 2024 and fifty three point three million in the twenty five twenty six season. He doesn't have an opt out. They're straight up, and we're talking about a thirty three year old who's already popped his Achilles. He's almost thirty four, and you got him under contract at fifty million, fifty three million when he's thirty eight years old. This is not LeBron James. This is not a guy who has proven throughout his career to be able to play an abnormal amount of games for stretches. You know, a guy who can take you to the finals every year and play 82 games. 
and and still do it at like 37 years old or 38 years old that's not who duran has been throughout his career and I, i'm not banking on him to become that guy at 34 35 36 37 38 i'm just not that that's crazy so I, I think it's intriguing the reason we bring it up is because like i do think that that's where the sacramento kings jump in they jump in on that deal they jump in on the donovan mitchell deal they jump in on one of these mega deals and that's how they try to go in and get the player that they really truly want um if they are going to make some ground you know all, some some altering franchise altering move because like you Harrison Barnes and some other stuff that might not seem that appealing. If you throw in a first round pick from the Kings, even if it's 2028, um, you're still looking at, you know, quality. If you, if you'll give a pick swap in 2023 and one of those first round picks, you know, you can be a valuable piece or partner in a mega deal for a team that's looking to get a whole bunch of picks. So I right. just hope as much talent as possible stays and goes to the Eastern Conference. There's enough in the West. Well, there that's what go. I was thinking because, like, if you were to ask me, hey, Sean, where do you think Kevin Durant ends up? I'm saying Phoenix. Phoenix. You still think so? Even yeah. after DeAndre Aiden off the table? Yeah. Because, you still because again, like, hmm. you know, they still have Devin Booker, and I could see it. Yeah, just like Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, and every pick yeah. that they own. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's intriguing. It's intriguing. Uh, good conversation. Okay, let's finish up with the business of basketball. Um, <laughs> Sean loves it, and Sean even loves it more. Movie. We did not. We did not do Tuesday. Thank God. Reactions. <laughs> Tuesday overreactions. We'll just mix Tuesday overreactions with the business of basketball, and ask this question: Does the signing of Kent Bazemore and uh, and Cook, uh, does it end the Sacramento Kings offseason? Is this it? Is this a team we're walking into the season with? Or are there still may, many, many options that you guys see could happen between now and October 20th, October 21st, or whenever it is? I'm going with the latter. I think that if I have to guess that the Kings get in on a move, kind of like what we were just talking about I, I think that they could be a third team that just still shuffles up their roster a little bit that way by by getting involved I, I could also see I don't think that they're making these signings because they're going to send out more players than they take back and and that's like planning ahead I, I think that they could just cut one of these two of these guys and and go into training camp with this sort of roster but if you're making me pick I'm, I'm going to say that they sneak into one more deal before Yeah, I think they can sneak into a deal. I don't know that it'll happen before camp opens. Um, you know, I, I I think at the end of the day, I don't think that they're going to be able to attach themselves to a KD deal uh, if if a KD deal is to be made. I think they're gonna, I think they'll like to try, but I just I, I I don't really see it necessarily. I guess I'd have to see what the other teams that could be involved are. But if I was betting, I, I think for it won't be for lack of trying, but I don't think they'll be able to, to do that. So if I take that off the table, um, I think there's probably a move or two out there that they'd like to make, but I don't think that they will before the start of training camp because I think you're going to get too close to training camp. You're going to maybe want to start to see what some things kind of look like a little bit. Um, competition within camp, maybe a preseason game or two, uh, and you get to the before the season starts, see if there's any camp meet that's been cut see if any injuries play out and, and then you might have some more options on your table that, that don't exist uh, on August 9th. So um, yeah, if I was betting, I don't think they really have another one in terms of signings. Yeah. I don't think, I think as Brendan said, I think if there is one to be out there, it's a, it's a move, it's a transaction, it's a trade. So I don't think it'll be a, uh, uh, I don't think it'll be any more signings. Yeah, I'm going to agree with that. I don't think there will be... I mean, they might bring a 20th guy into camp, but the Kings notoriously don't. They usually go with 18, 19 into camp. Um, you can go up to 20 on your training camp roster and then cut back down. Um, and 20 includes your two two-ways, so those are already locked up. Um, I think it's interesting. I think they would like to be part of something big here that happens and still like to do that one big move to try to like change you from you know a team that 
best case six, worst case 11, 12 to, you know, best case five, six, worst case eight, you know, that one move that puts you over the top. And so they're going to keep an open mind and, and, you know, see what they can do, but it's going to be hard to do. I, I think it will be hard to accomplish to really change. So I'm going to say that chances are this is the roster we're going to see go into training camp. Uh, it won't be the roster we see finish the season, but it will be the roster we see going to training camp. Just my opinion. Um, okay, so outside of that, uh, we do have the big news this this weekend, which was De'Aaron Fox and uh, Rase Caldwell getting married. Uh, so uh, congratulations to that looked the pretty cool, couple. by the way. Yeah, and everyone yeah, looked- and their dog was there, right? <laughs> no, not me. <laughs> yeah, we weren't invited. We weren't invited, no. Sean. No, that's fine. Uh, but no, it's uh, it looked it looked really pretty pretty special. So good for them. Yeah, and and you know I think we said it before, but shout out to our guy Jason Wise, and and uh, he got married this summer as well. He's he's been on like the like Jason Wise. Would you like get one of those NBA contracts or something? Man, that guy's been all <laughs> over Europe. Like congratulations, hey man, man. What do you, yeah, you gotta, you gotta that, do that's a great right? honeymoon. I think it's Nicole, right? Um, yeah, yeah, so her name's Nicole. Yeah, so shout out to the to the Wises and uh, the Foxes. Um, I don't know. Do we have any final thoughts, uh, Brennan? What do you got? Final thoughts? Uh, we haven't mentioned the name Keon Ellis, so Keon Ellis. And that's all I got. <laughs> Check. <laughs> Check. Keon Ellis. Yeah. Uh, I got some final thoughts. How about the, I got to? I started my day, uh, and I'm not trying to. Uh, although this is kind of a you're flex, getting big time. I'm not, I, I, I am. I am. It's it's definitely a name drop. Uh, I spent my time this morning interviewing Ice Cube again for the fr- uh, second time in this about three 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 months or so, and that's uh, because the Big Three uh, basketball tournament has their playoffs coming up, and it's really fun. Like <laughs> I've actually found myself watching quite a bit of it because there's so many lo- like local Kings, Northern California ties. Like you're seeing Royce White play well. Remember when he made his Kings debut and covered him up with the Reno Bighorns. And I don't like think he ever scored well. a point in the NBA. He didn't. No, he didn't. He never scored a single point. Uh, but logged a couple minutes in two games, and uh, actually I think it was like 30 seconds or something like that in the one home game. Um, but Is Barbosa actually, playing? Uh, I didn't see Bar. No, I didn't see Barbosa. Uh, he may have been a part of an earlier team, but they're down to their final four for the playoffs, and like one of them is coached by Nancy Lieberman. That's I believe that's power. And if you saw this past weekend, Katino Mobley, who's on that team, gray as can be, uh, <laughs> got into it with the coach of, I think it's Trilogy or th- uh, not Three Headed Monster. I think it's Trilogy. But anyway, they got in and <laughs> got into it with Rick Mahorn. That's a bold choice. Oh, no. That's yeah, not man. A, you chose poorly. Yeah. And it was a little bit of a like a scuffle off to the side. And it was it was shouting match. I don't think there was any fist thrown or anything like that. But. You got Mahmoud Abdul Raouf. You got Reggie Theus coaching. You've got um, who else? They write down. Uh, Dante yeah, Green was there, right? He was. Yeah, he's part. Of, he's not in the playoffs, but they're gonna have like their first All Star team, and it's just fun. Like, if if Big Three is what it takes for uh, you know a music head like me to have access to to Ice Cube and be able to talk to him several times a year, I'm all into it, man. Like, I'm gonna have that later this week, and it's just it's always a fun conversation. It was cool because like I'm literally standing at, at 49ers training camp last week and i get a text and i'm like they're like hey would you like to talk to ice cube again about the big got the big three playoffs coming up they're gonna have their first all-star team a game because they used to do in the championship game they used to do like a third place prize and nobody wanted to be a part of that so they're gonna have an all-star game before the championship i think it's on the 21st and they're also gonna have a celebrity game and cube said he's not playing in that like that's uh he's, he says he's retired but it's just kind of fun. Like I'm, I was like, man, I just talked to him the other day, and I'm, I imagine the scenario. I'm like, wait, am I really like thinking about not talking to Ice Cube like for the second time this summer? Of course not. I'm going to talk to Ice Cube, so we're definitely doing that. So well, Sean and Ice Cube there. are now best friends. He will uh, save him at some concert at some point and carry <laughs> him to safety. Speaking and, and of which, wait, they're so that, close. He calls him Cube. Did did Cube. you catch that, Brendan? Like, well, you don't call him Ice because that's reserved for <laughs> Vanilla Ice. You just call Vanilla Ice Ice, and you call Ice Cube Cube. But uh, no, but it was funny because after I got that that text, and I was like noodling it through because like, of course we're going to talk to Ice Cube. They announced that Ice Cube's coming to Sacramento. He's going to have a holiday jam at Golden One Center. So see how it all just ties together. 
So it's he's, like he's, you're going to see him again three times in one year. You guys will be BFFs that you yeah, like will we have to have a buddy film or something. Summit Bottle Rock? Like, man, yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And then I could maybe be in Ride Along 3. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah. He also, uh, like, the Kings also did something with 50 Cent, right? They did. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not quite sure yeah. what's happening. Give him a grand tour. Like, they, it's funny to watch the video uh, that I think 50 Cent people put out. It was on his channel. I know the Kings had put some stuff out too, but it was like, here he is, like, walking through. He's meeting Monty McNair. He's getting shown the basketball operations department and, like, like a sea of people just following him. Like all these people must have, I, I mean, there's certain, there's some familiar faces within the organization, but it's like, everyone's just following him like through the halls. And the, as he kind of makes his way from, you know, the, the certain different parts of the arena to the practice facility, to the court. And, you know, he's putting up shots and it's just, just, to, I always find it funny where you see like a sea of people following basically just one person. It's like it a like Drake esque situation. <laughs> yeah. Like, the Drake situation, the infamous, infamous. They, he's gonna, from what I understand, he's going to be pretty involved, though. Like, they've got some drink options, like in some of the primo lounges that they're going to have. And I know they've got the music sessions that they do throughout the year. And I think he's going to have a little bit of influence throughout the game night entertainment stuff. So, like, it's, it's, uh, they're going all in with 50 Cent. So that's kind of fun. All in. Maybe he's that 20th roster spot. There, there it is. Be. There it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, it's intriguing, to say the least. Uh, who knows? These things uh, tend to happen in Sacramento. Um, just Kelsey Grammer <laughs> one time sat courtside. That's okay. He was just a guest. Glenn Close. You guest. remember? She stood up. She I was do. supposed to be there and didn't show up, I think. Yeah. I don't so. remember seeing her. Yeah, I remember Kelsey Grammer, Jamie Foxx several times, you know? Yeah, yeah, Jamie Foxx. But, but those are like one-offs, you know, or like – Jimmy Fox and Drake were like a few times throughout yeah, the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this Brett Favre like, was there last year. Oh, was, Brett Favre was, was there last year, and he was, who yeah. was he sitting by? Ron Artest. What was it? No, I don't. Was that the? Was that the? Uh, I think Vladi was there. Wasn't Chuck Liddell there one night? That's who it Chuck, was. Chuck Liddell's been there a few times. Yeah, I think and that, that that's who he was. I think yeah. so. That's, that's who he's the randomness it is golden one center the ice man chuck liddell there's another ice for you ice man chuck liddell. yeah UFC all right so i'm going to close up our final thoughts with if you have a chance drive by uh arco arena they're tearing that thing down so uh say goodbye one last time they have removed the six man statue um i don't know where that went uh but uh you know who knows like it's in james's backyard yeah, I would have taken it. I would put it in the front yard, just like suck it. You got a big six out there. <laughs> You're like, what's the six for? I just like, what are you talking about? That's just, that's the six. Uh, yeah, so uh, drive by Arco Arena. It is getting imploded or exploded or torn down brick by brick. I'm not sure which it is, but it seems like it's a mess. Um, and it will no longer be there. Unlike Arco One, which will always be there, hiding right in plain sight. It's a state um, building now. It's the Department of Consumer Affairs, still owned by Buzz Oats, the Buzz Oats Foundation, the Buzz Oats Group, whatever they call themselves. Um, all right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the King's Beat Podcast. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday or Friday with another episode. Hopefully, the Kings will sign two more players so we can talk about them ad nauseum. Um, that should be fun. Uh, so for Fox 40s, Sean Cunningham and... The King's Pulse Podcast. <laughs> Brendan Newton. It comes off like Freddy Krueger in a way. I am James Hammond, yeah, King's one. Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. We'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.